everybody, and welcome back to the Chiluminati Podcast, episode 131. As always, I am one of your hosts, Mike Martin, joined by my two friends and co-hosts, Jesse Cox and Alex Fasciane. How's it going, boys? <laughs> yeah, I'm just gonna... That's our little theme song. That's like, you know, the show has a theme song, but right, then right. when you talk about how we're both from LA, that's the new, that, that's the LA theme song. <laughs> the LA theme song. Don't you just want to surf to that? Don't you just want to? Is that, is, is that, no, that, is that no, the emotion that's not surfing. That's like surfing. Our surfing like. <laughs> 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 yeah. No, Suck not down that. a couple Coronas or any other beer that doesn't sound <laughs> like the name of a. <laughs> 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 Couple of that's probably the best opening we've ever had. Oh, yeah. Totally Appreciate together. It. Tidy. Yeah. Thought out. Uh, absolutely. On, Only uh, one on thing target. missing, really. And yeah, yeah. And that is a brand deal for our own show at <laughs> patreon.com slash Chiluminati pod, which you <laughs> can join at any time. If you like this show and you're not on there, give it a give it a little shot. Just jump on there. Just have a look. Just tell me what you think. You know, you know what? I'm not going to even put pressure on you to join. Just hop on there. Patreon.com slash Chiluminati pod. Head over there. It's a place where you can put money towards the show and support it. And you get things in return and you be the judge. You tell me if it is in the best value you've ever seen. You tell me if those early mini sods aren't the greatest thing you've ever seen. You tell me <laughs> if the exclusive art doesn't kick ass. You tell me if getting merch whenever we put out merch isn't a great benefit. You tell me. And you'll have to tell us if our movie commentary is any good this month. Later oh my this gosh. Month. You have to let us know. As we but, watch Mothman but later I'm, this month. But I'm not going to let you, I'm not going to tell you, you, you have to find out for yourself. Patreon.com <laughs> slash Chiluminati pod. It's a Merry Christmas. You know, it'd be yeah. nice. It'd be nice to, you know, to, you know, to head over there. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> I, was, I was gonna, I just want to let that, I just gonna let that go. What you saying? Yeah. <laughs> it'd be nice. Listen, I, I, full disclosure, I took my my COVID booster the other like just recently. I feel like shit. It feels like somebody punched me in the arm. I'm I am at is that Krampus? true? Yeah, the Krampus I had is nothing. They told dude, me it was a half dose and I was, it, it was gonna be easy, and I was like, yeah, I'm good. So I guess, and this is this is me being like a YouTube mathematician right now. But all right, I looked at a thing, and I think most of the 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 boosting combinations. You know, if you look at the like little chart that like tells you what happens when you take each one with the other one, most of them, it's like, hey, you get like 15 times the protection that you had before. But my combination is the J&J original and the Moderna, Moderna, I don't know, booster. <laughs> Moderna. And my number was 76 times. Uh, so you are like. I don't know what it is. I'm assuming that it's because my body is on overdrive right now. I think I th well, I think because wasn't it like Moderna was out of all the efficacy still like Moderna was still at like 95 percent even when boosters were coming out and J&J &J dropped rapidly. So yeah. your body was probably yeah. like, oh, we're doing this again. So yeah. that was because <laughs> yeah. I'm three Moderna in a row. So that makes yeah. sense why I would have nothing. And you're like, oh. Yeah, I can't believe. I'm it. curious. I get mine this weekend. I had Pfizer, so we'll see what what the are booster does. Are you getting does Pfizer again, or are you getting a different? I don't know. I think they they have Moderna and Pfizer available where I'm going. I don't know if I have a choice or if they're just gonna pick it one honestly, for me when I get there. Truthfully, it the doesn't, matter. doesn't matter. Yeah. It doesn't yeah matter. And let me figure. let me tell you something. I've already just by getting this, the idea of Christmas is like fifteen times easier to bear. <laughs> Feels better. Yeah. 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 So I'm I'm happy to be where I am today. And right. a day of discomfort is not worth not getting this booster shot. So you should go get it. And get or, your flu shot while you're at it if you have get it. Get yourself over to patreon.com slash Chiluminati Pod. <laughs> where today not only are we gonna sell you our own our own products, we're gonna tell you oh. what to do with your bodies. So get get ready. Okay. Can I bring the mood down now? Are we good from here? Whoa! How what? much far from here at this at this peak? Yes, yes, yeah. boys. You know we're in for a good time when I come with a two parter because my two parters are never fun. They're your, never your two exciting. parters are like always a one parter that like is so fucked up that now it's a two parter. 
<laughs> well, uh, we're in a, you know, we're in a fun, light, family friendly sort of, uh, you know, setting. And since it's coming up on the holidays, you can th- can you think of anything better than cozying up by the fire as a kid, hot chocolate in your hands and your dear sweet grandma smiling away as you eat her definitely not poisoned big treats? Because that sounds like the kind of person that I would want to spend my holiday with. Today is going to be part one of the two-parter true crime tale that is all about the serial killer, Giggling uh, Granny Nanny Doss. What? Giggling Granny Nanny Doss? Yes, sir. You got it right. That's her name, a Giggling Granny. We'll talk about how she got that name at the giggling end of granny, the next granny part. Doss. It's like, <laughs> does it have to do with computers? <laughs> no, no. D-O-S-S, unfortunately. Not MS-DOS? The no, obvious- it's not MS-DOS. This is a GGN DOS. GGN DOS. I don't, this Giggling is, Granny Nanny. Giggling Granny Nanny not. <laughs> so Somebody's Nanny gonna, DOS was a serial killer from the nanny. early uh, that oh. operated. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> You're like, we're like, it's Giggling Granny Nanny DOS. Anyway, Nanny DOS was a serial killer. <laughs> That's true. She, yeah. yeah. Well, you got you to gotta bring it back down to reality for a moment. Yeah. She was a serial killer that operated in the early to mid 1900s who operated in multiple towns and cities across the United States, though eventually caught there was a real chance that Nanny would have not only gotten away with it, but lived a luxurious life and comfortable life later on, all while she continued her killing. For many, Nanny Doss is the very definition of a black widow. And on that, let's acknowledge our main source for this series, the book called Black Widow by Ryan Green. Pretty <laughs> by great Stan true crime Lee? book. No. <laughs> by Stan Lee, yeah. <laughs> Stan Lee's Black Widow. <laughs> Um, this is a pretty good true crime book. If you're if you're in part of that book club over on Discord, I would say maybe it's a little biased and maybe framing her as a victim more than anything else. But we'll talk about that as we discuss her crimes going forward. Uh, but like all true crime tales, our story doesn't actually start with Nanny. Her story starts with her mother, Louisa Holder. Now, we don't have a lot of information about her mother, other than that she came from a rather poor background and lived in a small insular town with conservative parents. In fact, we find Louisa at this time, in 1905, pregnant. More importantly, especially for the time in such a small town in Alabama, pregnant out of wedlock. We know she hid her pregnancy for as long as she could, and the father was not in the picture whatsoever. We aren't sure if it's because she refused to give the name of the man that she had slept with to protect him or if Lou genuinely didn't know who the father was. But whatever the case, she gave she never gave a name, though it's suspected it was a soldier stationed at the nearby base in Anniston. Even when she could no longer hide the pregnancy from her family and her father, uh, she she had her mind set on not giving up the father's name. Uh. Luckily for Lou, her mother would step in before her father would beat the baby out of her. Her mother would step in before any physical uh, assaults would happen. And for whatever reason, her father was entirely content beating his own daughter, but he refused to lay a hand on his wife. So without being able to beat his daughter into an abortion, he did the only thing he could that was almost as cool. Yeah, yeah, I told you this is going to be not a, yeah. a pleasant. I mean, you yeah. did. Yeah. And I tried to give you the warning. <laughs> um, he kicked her out of the house and had his family disown her, uh, his daughter entirely until that she would give the name of the father so that her father could go take his ire out on him. And she was now, according to the town's rumors, a ruined woman in the eyes of their community. But Louisa held strong and never gave them the name. She found a one room apartment and did odd jobs around town for sympathetic women who would pay meager amounts of of money to her. Her savings and money she had, however, quickly ran dry, especially as her pregnancy came ever closer to its end. And worse yet, winter was approaching further and further into into debt. She would fall and with no way of undoing it. But she still persisted regardless. And on November 4th, 1905, Lou's reputation as a ruined woman was etched into stone for some when she had her first child out of wedlock. And Nancy, better known as Nanny later in life, was born. And as quickly as Lou had become a ruined woman, no more than a week later did Lou get a proposal for marriage. A man with land, his own farm, a hard work ethic, and one who cared not about a child that was not his tagging along, a man by the name of James Hazel had taken and saved Lou from the worst depths of debt. 
thank you to Magic Spoon for sponsoring this episode. Growing up, cereal is one of the best parts of being a kid, but I had to give it up because I realized it was full of sugar and junk that you really shouldn't eat. And we're all trying to eat better, but a healthy breakfast doesn't have to be boring. Magic Spoon has all the amazing flavors you love without all the bad stuff inside it, and it's amazing as a midnight snack right before bed too. With Magic Spoon, you're getting zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and only four net grams of carbs in each serving. It's only 140 calories a serving as well. It's keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, and low-carb. And with Magic Spoon, you can build your own box. Available flavors to build your very own custom bundle are cocoa, fruity, frosted, peanut butter, blueberry, cinnamon, cookies and cream, and maple waffle. All you have to do is go to magicspoon.com chill to grab a custom bundle of cereal and try it today. And be sure to use our promo code chill at checkout to save $5 off your order. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Remember, Get your next delicious bowl of guilt-free cereal at magicspoon.com slash chill and use code chill to save $5 off. Thank you to Magic Spoon for sponsoring the episode. Unfortunately for Lou and Nanny, what they hadn't realized was James himself was not in a good place. James's farm on the outside looked like a small idyllic farm anywhere in some backwater town, but the farm itself was a curse more than anything. James had inherited the farm from his family when they passed, and it was more mud than dirt, uh, mud and dirt than grass, and growing crops wasn't even happening. Moreover, James had inherited the farm much earlier in his life than he might have hoped, and after paying off all the debts and loans to keep the farm in his family's name, he was left with very little other than the plot of land and himself. No hired hands to help, no crops were growing, nothing. So he didn't and actually help her out of shit. Yes, that's very, yeah, very much so. But Lou, uh, in that time, she was so enamored with anybody giving her even the basis level of like uh, just like letting her in. And you, I guess you could call it care or any sort of empathy. Just and she yeah, not on getting she, the shit beat out of her for being pregnant. Basically, yeah. exactly that. And that was all it took for her to be like, I'm in. And it also she was in debt and her family refused to take her back at all. And James wow, had a pension. Lua. Yeah, no, it's not a good situation. And James ha and James Hazel had a penchant for his unrelenting pride. No amount of charity or free charity or free help, which was offered, was ever accepted. But in Lou and Nanny, he saw two things. One, his own loneliness and need for marriage would be sated and checkmark would be ticked off for his own family. But more importantly for him, he'd finally have hands around the farm to help. That would cost nothing. A baby? <laughs> we'll talk about when Nanny what started year was working this again? around. What, what year? 1905. All right. Oh, I mean, that's like, it's all starting to click still. I mean, 1905 yeah. is still very close to, I mean, it's still in the time period where people are like, look, kids are hands. Like, it's this still, is like, blood meridian. This is insane. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and it also checks out the like, you know, uh, spoiler alert for everyone who's not from the United States, but this country yeah. has some very puritanical origins. So, you know, the whole like we disown you for having a child and you're <laughs> like that whole thing. Boy, Americans love to do that kind of garbage. Yes, we, are we were so puritanical at the very beginning. <laughs> yeah, uh, luckily that faded away yeah. as the decades wore on. <laughs> and now America is known as one of the freest and most tolerant places on the globe. Uh, yeah. Once married, though, Lou moved right into the Hazel Farm with Nanny, and the town rumor mill spun up, placing James as the hidden mysterious father, even if this was far, far from the truth. But... It was good enough for Luis's parents, and they quickly made that story their own reality and saw a way out of their ruined daughter's reputation and stigma that had clung to her and their family ever since they had that child. So in their eyes, James was the father. And then they and walked married. up the street and saw a cow coughing up dust in the fucking backyard. <laughs> and then they said, they were, oh shit, we're fucked. It's like um, uh, <clears throat> Courage the Cowardly Dog, like that farm. Yeah, like in that yeah farm exactly. Just pure dust dirt, nothing else. But for Louisa, there was no honeymoon period at all. 
and what little affection that he had shown Lou to win her heart, the absolute bare minimum, had evaporated almost instantly. Lou was put to work on the farm from day one, and James's true self was revealed as an awful and hateful man. And Lou should ever be, uh, and should Lou ever be deemed slacking or disagreeing with James, he would verbally assault her before grabbing his cattle cane and beating her physically. Cattle cane? Oh my yeah. god! Yeah, dude, what yeah. the fuck, man? 1905. Ugh, God, just ugh, this is a wild time. Their daily life would be 12 plus hours of farm work with no day off or end in sight. They were the only two to maintain the farm, and most nights they'd end up awake until 12 or 1 a.m. or maybe later, finally being able to sleep for a couple hours, only to wake up at dawn and tend to the animals and other farm labor. And due to this, Nanny's entire childhood consisted of her being ignored unless it was absolutely necessary she had to be taken care of. And the moment Nanny could walk, at three years old, she was working on the farm doing little tasks that didn't need brute strength to endure. And should Nanny not get them done in the allotted times that James had said, he didn't spare her any of the punishment that he would give her mother. She received just as much of a beating as her mother would. He was a piece of shit. How many years of this? Uh, we'll get to that. This is literally within the first Two years or so, three years or so. But how old is this baby? She, the baby was Young, born. This and is a week a later. She got married. Yeah, this is a this is a toddler. This is a what like can you two- expect of this baby? Like what in the? F- All right, Just little tiny. I know. Stuff, I'm, I I'm, I'm like, asking an insane question. I realize. Yeah, exactly. Like, what can a three year old really do? Exactly. But it didn't take long for James to realize he would need way more hands, and money would never be something they had. But he had a wife. And one who could bear children. And a cattle cane. And a cattle cane. Yep, pretty much. And so, shortly after Nanny began helping work on the farm, James would get Lou pregnant four times. One brother, three sisters. The pregnancies. I just have a bunch of babies and wait (coughs) 15 years, this this farm will pay for itself. That is is literally the way they did it, though. Imagine how 17, 18, even to 60, basically throughout human history, it was like, look, if we have enough kids, that'll take care of the land. (laughs) Literally. (laughs) And like, you're you're dead on. Like, for this, and this is a perfect example. Like, so much so that the pregnancies, James timed the pregnancies so they were as close as they could be ensuring not to get Lou pregnant during the harvest season as he would need her help, but still keeping the pregnancies as close as possible what to get the kids out. What a piece of shit. How? And by, how <laughs> Ryan, no, it, how is he even feeding the mind. kids? Like, what is he doing? He, he has no money. Corn they go into town for errands, but yeah, like not a whole lot. Corn like, pone, mm. corn pone, fat back, you know, the, corn all the, all the pone <laughs> fat back. All the all the all the old all the oldies but goodies. Yeah. <laughs> Dust and water. <laughs> but yeah, with, blood yeah, berry, right. soup, potato blood soup. Ba- potato soup. Uh and by 1910, at the age of five, Nanny was not only helping to take care of the farm, but was on newborn infant duty with her siblings constantly. Her school life would become non existent only ever attending school when the farm was in its slow season, but leaving once again once she was needed back at home. Her education would only ever reach that of grade level, and her social life as a young girl was totally non-existent. So, Nanny found a love for escapist entertainment in the early 1900s. Reading. She was a voracious reader, particularly of romance novels, and no matter how difficult her life seemed to be, Nanny was notably always cheerful, easygoing, and willing to try and sate James's ever-growing and aggressive demeanor. She just wanted, essentially, approval. And this would be her life for a few years. It's like with exactly very like Ed Gein. Like, exactly. Yeah, there's a lot of similarities in, in people who kind of become killers. Um, and we'll see some more uh, as we keep going here. Uh, like I said, this is her life for the next few years, and very little changed. The farm was her life, and her foreseeable future, even at such a young age, was this place. Then, something occurred that seems to happen often with people who end up becoming serial killers. One day, in the spring of 1912, during a really nasty storm that was hitting Alabama, and it was on a, the storm was hitting on a rare day where the family was heading into town for supplies. 
The children were being children and standing up in the carriage and causing a ruckus. But eventually, Louisa handed Nanny a true romance magazine that she had read more times than she could count. And Nanny remembers sitting in the carriage, reading the magazine before everything went black. A tree had been knocked down in the road from the storm. And by the time the driver had seen it, they were almost too late. He slammed on the brakes. And since this is 1912, every no one was really wearing seatbelts because I don't think they really existed. And everybody got sent flying forward. Everyone else had come out with just scrapes and bruises, but Nanny wasn't so lucky. She was seated directly in front of a metal bar. And as she was sent forward, she collided with the bar, knocking her unconscious and definitely giving her a massive concussion. At seven years old, Nanny had endured such a bad concussion, it left her with brain damage. So just getting hit in the head is like super... it's like yeah. the same thing as the the like NFL scandal, like these people lashing out yeah. in like violence or like wrestlers or something like wrestlers that. Wrestlers is another good one. Did you, yeah. did you see this this thing recently about this dude who uh, I guess he killed someone? I, I don't have the article in front of me, but I, but it was a football player killed some people, and then the brain scans are like, yo, this guy got beat up playing ball, and yeah. it ruined the part of his brain that makes it like. Hey, don't kill people. <laughs> yeah, there's like yeah. a Will Smith movie about that. Yes, there is. Yeah, where he's like the guy who discovers it and they're in the NFL is trying to cover it up for mm-hmm. however long, yeah. as long as they possibly can. But yeah, like that kind of stuff does permanent, permanent damage that just cannot be undone. And for the rest of Nanny's life, she would now suffer from sudden sharp headaches and random bouts of sickness. But perhaps more telling for our story, people noted her personality from then on permanently changed sure. she still was her bright and cheery self a good chunk of her time but that cheery disposition would immediately evaporate at the slightest hint of anything going wrong she had consistent and regular bouts of what they called it in that time dark moods which was long-lasting depression that would outlast even her worst headaches though even more curious nanny was suddenly prone to bouts of pure unfiltered rage, violent, screaming rage at the age of seven onward. And out of, and it always seemed to come out of nowhere. They would simply have to endure until this dark mood would pass. I mean, coming out of nowhere seems like not true. <laughs> like she yeah, well, is it's girl, absolutely due to get whacked in, in the, the best way. Whacked in the, like she's, she's got probably got a, a lot per- of things to be angry about. I'll say yeah, that. Yes, yeah, she yeah, absolutely yeah. does. You are a hundred percent correct. It's so crazy and, that some people get hit in the head at a young age and become a murderer. And some people get hit in the head at a young age and become like, I was the wife of the Pharaoh and I was yeah. in a ghost relationship with him. You know, it's like, the same thing, and then it made them both just go down a crazy road. I was hitting the head multiple times as a kid. Yeah, and look where you are That's now. Not even a Your joke. success. I had a an X ray machine fall on my head. Famous. Yeah. An X ray machine fell on my head. I uh, oh. jumped off a swing, and a oh stick my. lodged in my skull. I got hit in the head. A friend hit me in the head with a golf club as I went to go put a golf ball down on the tee. This is all before I was like. 14 years old just yeah. brutalized as a kid I, I have a dent in my head from when i fell down the stairs uh in a in a play it's, it's right here man everything yeah. everything's starting to make sense boys oh, oh, tra- oh, traumatic head injuries for me though oh, my parents were like we are surprised you lived through your like early <laughs> years because you were always hurt and i was like yeah that's that checks out maybe one of those head injuries made you a serial killer and one it did, undid it. It. yeah but <laughs> i had three head injuries oh, oh no and then one made you hollywood <laughs> psychopath and now here you are yeah 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 <laughs> And uh, kind of rearing back to the story, though, I will say to Louisa's credit, her mother, she did want to bring her to the hospital immediately and constantly begged James to. But James forbid it because they just straight up didn't have the money to handle it. Hmm. What's that like? Yeah, another another 1910s problem. Long gone. Thank thank God we moved on from that. (laughs) America. (laughs) <laughs> oh my god there's gonna be like two really angry people in the comments it's gonna be funny no, as hell. I think there's a lot more because that. they know yeah. it's true <laughs> <laughs> though there's speculation that in no small part it, that in no small part that this was more it, obviously because of the money but also because nanny wasn't actually his by blood and as time continued to pass nanny never getting medical treatment 
it became clearer and clearer to Nanny herself that she was the odd child out when it came to her stepfather. In many ways, James had become god of their little world, making himself the center with no will of their own. His word was law, and if he demanded something, it got done. And as time continued, Nanny would prove to be the little devil in his world, one to cause havoc and chaos the best she could. It's it's pretty tropey, the idea that like he yeah. had nothing and his world was chaos, and so he made his own and created his like own little 100%. fiefdom. Yeah, like it checks out and sort of he, like I mean, a, he, he the dick the bag handbook. V- it's there. He, yeah. He literally picked the most in that time, most vulnerable, down on her luck woman he could possibly find. Yeah. And just was like, You're saved now, but now you owe me by being my slave. Pretty and much that's how like, it went. yeah, it's like I it's so crazy <laughs> how like in media and in in stuff like we are like all on top of this. We like get this and yet it just still happens. Yeah. And her and Nanny's new aggressive personality had truly come to the forefront and her siblings quickly learned not to get in her way or upset her as Nanny was far from scared of beating her own siblings if they if the feeling took to her. And Nanny had lost all fear of James and his beatings at this point. Her life was filled with constant pain as it was as it was already. So for the first time in her life, Nanny truly began to hate someone. The man who she tried for years to please as a young child was suddenly seen for the man that he was. And while James still had held power over her, Nanny was now very aware of the very kind of man her stepfather had become. Nanny's reading habits also changed a bit, though outwardly it would be hard to tell. She still read voraciously. But romance novels were no longer just her favorite. They had become her obsession, a Hmm. fantasy that she would regularly dream about. The knight in shining armor, the wistful bliss of sudden and intense love, being taken away from everything that she hated by a man who would save her and give her the world. That was Nanny's fantasy. And now it was all she could think about, that her love was out there, true love and dreaming was all Nanny could do as James had forbid his children to attend the local barn parties and hoot nannies that could be heard and seen from a distance on warm summer nights. He forbid his child from going to a hoot nanny in 1912. What a no monster. No nannies. No Mo- hoot nannies the whole, for the children. Uh, why even bother living? <laughs> what is a hoot nanny? A hoot nanny? Like music you, and dancing. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm picturing like eating and some type of slime dancing and maybe there's like a greased up pig, pig? running around well, yeah you catch the pig and am i in the right zone oh Ooh. nanny yeah is that like a old school kickback or is it bigger yeah, that's it's bigger than it's that. just like yeah Block it's a bigger party. than like a kickback it's a much more of a party i think feeling okay. than a kickback right. chill there's music live music and dancing like and that, not that there that was anything else that, in 1912 that, that but. uh party that inexplicably has zz top at it in uh, Back it, to the Future 3. It literally is like, grab a folk singer, grab yep. some hay, put it around on the ground, dancing and eating weird things out of, you know, okay. whatever the equivalent of and a paper plate would have been. Yeah. And then like, you know, like, and that's one of the only times, kind of think of it like, what, yeah. it's like one of the only times kids can go dance with their crushes too, instead of just being under their, their parents' thumb it, or doing work. It's like a prom the way they can go for out everyone. There. Except yeah. it's not, they aren't playing like, uh, a slow jam at a hootenanny. No, it's always no, fast. There's no it's like a slow. Hootenanny. We're holding each other's songs. It's all like we're dancing and we're having a good time, and it's totally not sexual or anything, even though it's probably still happening. I love yeah. that song. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, to that point, James's reason he would claim for not allowing them to go was that he was worried about his girls and uh, and his, his children's purity. What a good guy. He's. What's yeah, he talking he was, about? He That's said, more hands for the farm. You big idiot. That's why his farm <laughs> failed. <laughs> No, because then the, the, all his daughters would leave. They'd all remember this is the time where the daughter would go live with the with the husband and at their house. They wouldn't the husband wouldn't come there. Right. And he had mostly right. daughters. He only had one son. So he needed his girls uh, and men for him. Men couldn't be trusted. They were all lecherous and hateful animals. The only social events that they would ever be allowed to attend to would be the occasional family gathering that was all exclusively James's side of the family. Why are you laughing? Nothing. It's just, again, a tropey classic example of projection. He's like, oh, men yeah, no. are evil. Like, yeah, bro. What makes Dude, you think he, that? Yeah. Uh, you know, let's, let's, let's actually examine that thought a little further now that we're at the family gathering that everybody's allowed to. <laughs> yeah. Explicitly James's family, the Hazel family. The Hazel family was large and spread out, but they would come together as frequently as they could. 
and Nanny would quickly realize that James's preaching of purity would fall by the wayside when it came to all the uncles and other male family members that he had. Are you serious? Yeah. And on another note, to prove to Nanny that she mar- mattered very little compared to the kids that were by his blood, family members who were caught by James himself sexually assaulting his daughters by blood on multiple occasions, his reaction would beat the fuck out of the person who did who was doing it. The family very quickly <sighs> learned that if they abused or molested his blood daughters, James would beat the hell out of them for daring to hurt his girls. But when they were caught doing the same to Nanny, he would turn and go the other way. And when they arrived home, Nanny would be the one to receive the beatings for daring to set such a horrible example example for her younger sisters, while further implying the apple hadn't fallen far from the tree in regards to her mother, just to remind them all who was in charge and who they served. And Nanny's hate grew, basically just insulting Louisa for having a child out of wedlock in the process of beating her own cha- her own daughter. Thank you to Felix Gray for sponsoring this episode. And ever since I got my Felix Gray blue light glasses in the mail all those months ago, there hasn't been a work day where I haven't worn them. They have saved me so many unnecessary headaches and saved my eyes a whole lot of strain. Felix Gray are the blue light glasses that started it all. Five years ago, Felix Gray realized and set out to create eyewear that would improve daily screen time. And since then, Felix Gray has been on a mission to create a better relationship with technology. Felix Grey lenses filter 15 times more of the most important blue light for your eyes. Instead of putting a filter over the lenses, the blue light filtering material is built into the lens itself. Whether you're heading back to the office, back to school, or back to whatever, you can count on Felix Grey. All you have to do is visit felixgrayglasses.com slash chill. Both non-prescription and prescription glasses are available, so check them out at felixgrayglasses.com slash chill. That's F-E-L-I-X-G-R-A-Y glasses.com slash chill. Free shipping, free returns, free exchanges. FelixGrayGlasses.com slash chill. So that's kind of like where Nanny's upbringing took place. It wouldn't take long for Nanny to desperately seek any escape, a way out of this hell that was her life. Her reading materials changed from romance novels to romance columns in the newspapers, writing off letters in hopes that the young suitors would come by and scoop her up to save her. But whether James had found the responses before she did or simply nobody had replied, Nanny had never gotten an answer. And in my opinion, I don't think anybody replied because I feel like if James had caught the letters, he would have just beat her some more. And she never ended up getting beatings for ever sending letters out. So I don't think anybody just ever replied. But she continued, regardless, to look for an escape, and while still never being allowed to leave James's watchful eye. But Nanny was smart. She knew well and good that the farm was failing, only ever breaking even in its best years. And she knew that if she was to get out of the house, it would initially have to be something that James approved of. So in 1920, at the age of 15, Nanny approached her parents with an offer. Instead of continually sending her to school on the seasons she could, why bother at all? She was already too far behind to catch up to a kid's her age. Maybe it'd be better. Yeah, it's it's shit. It's 19. But like, this is also kind of common for 1920s in the early 1900s. Sucks. Um, And maybe she said to her family that maybe it'd be better if she went out into town and got a job instead. She could bring money back to help the farm while simultaneously getting out of James's hair. Simultaneously working in a sweatshop. Literally, yeah, and that's what we'll, we'll, as we'll find out is kind of like where she ended up. But she also got out of James's hair, but still maintained his trust. James listened to the offer, and after sleeping on it for a night, he couldn't find a single reason to not let her do that, and so he agreed. And in the summer of 1920, Nanny was fi- finally allowed into town on her own, looking for a job she could work at for, uh, far from her house while maybe finally having a taste of that fantastical social life that, that she dreamt of for crazy. years. Absolutely crazy. Absolutely <laughs> crazy. <laughs> what, what aspect of it? Just the whole thing? I mean, yeah, the whole thing. Uh, like, I understand wanting to get out of a, a bad situation. Like, mm-hmm. I get that. Um, it's just crazy that it's like the way she could do it is by saying, like, look, dad, I don't want none of this fancy education. 
Yeah. What I want <laughs> yeah, is yeah. to go work as a young kid and like, you know, bring home some money to the family. And he's like, yeah, that's a terrific <laughs> idea. <laughs> oh, yeah, I hate the, that. The past sucked. It sucked a lot. And, and nothing it, has changed at all. No, we're in much Wait, I mean, situation. everything has changed. Everything has changed yeah, that is way. what yeah, I meant to what say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. And it wouldn't take long for Nanny to secure a job in the small town of Blue Mountain, Alabama at the local linen thread mill. Jesus, still it literally, Bidden, literally is a sweatshop. Yes, yes, yes. Where else is she going to work as a kid I in don't the know, 1920s? A fucking soda shop, a fucking <laughs> DZ Discovery Zone. Give this, <laughs> give her something to feel joy about in her life. <laughs> Jesus no, Christ, Dude, I. I feel for a little bit. I my summer breaks when I was fourteen and fifteen. My parents made me get a job. A I had to go shop? get work. I had, no, not a sweatshop. All right, I, I was I was a janitor at the local church in the school over the summer. But you know, close enough. Whoa! At fifteen, they were like, "This kid can handle chemicals that clean." Oh my <laughs> yeah. god! Yeah, actually, yeah. I didn't think about that. How, that clean was that church, how clean was that church, though? Did you like? <laughs> I mean, man, it was real good. Did you stick it to the I, church. I worked with somebody who was shit. very clearly in college, and he introduced me to the Red Hot Chili Peppers. That's, gotcha. Thank God, that's as far as he got. <laughs> I just that's all I know. That's all. Anyway, yeah, I didn't work at a, thread, a, linen, a local linen thread mill in Blue Mountain, Alabama, like Nanny did, though. And while she was still forbidden from wearing makeup by James, her clothing became less bland as a matter of necessity if she was to work in the mill. See, what all James allowed her his daughters to wear were like brown sacks as like dresses and like very simple covers what? everything garb. And it was very loose fitting. It wasn't form fitting. It just covered everything. <laughs> you know, you got, I wish you could see it, podcast listeners, but. Alex is just leaned forward and shaking his head. Jesse's hands went down his face. They are just so distraught I, by this I just, clothing. It's crazy to me that as we do all these stories, the beginning is always the same. Yeah. It's <laughs> like a guy that's like, I want to be as terrible as possible to my child. Fuck her up as, as much as I possibly can. <laughs> But it's, it's a rough, but it's like it's it, it, like no matter what happens, it is very clearly obvious that it's it goes back. It's like one generation of terrible people leads to another generation of terrible people that gets worse and worse. till eventually someone's a psycho killer. It's like, crazy. Yeah. It's crazy it's that called, it took it's till like, like, it's called well, generational I, trauma. I, it just feels <laughs> like it's crazy that like it took us until like halfway through the 20th century to be like. Do serial killers. Dude, are we the bad guys? Like, like, like did we figure, are we fucking, are, are we letting people down and then they become serial killers? It's usually that. Is there mi a profile? Like poor parenting leading to a head injury at the same time. Yeah. You know, it's a combination of like both. And, and I, there's a point, there's a point to be made there. It's like, I, I believe if Nanny's home life hadn't been as bad as it was and she still had endured the head injury she could have probably been okay this feels she like a fucking heavy-handed D, D story like it feels like too many of the like tropey details <laughs> yeah. are in one story like that's fucking it's your, insane. it's your first it's your first serious D, &D character and you really want to go ham on the backstory yeah. so it's the also DM very obvious that there's no one it. there's no one in her life to be her champion no, and no, I think that's what it's like in every one of these stories. It's always like, and the only people they had to turn to were awful people and they were put in yep. awful situations. And it's just like, there was not one single person in any of these stories. who was like, yo, you need to get out of this situation. And like, we need to get you some help. Not right. once and, and to, to, to even kind of honestly, just hammer on that point. Uh, even Lou, her mother, when uh, wouldn't protect her, even going so much as like when when James would beat Nanny, she just counted herself lucky that she wasn't the one being beaten and just let it happen. Like she was never there to protect her daughter, even if she still cared and loved about her daughter to some degree, which she did on some level. But that's you know, that's the trauma of being kicked out of home. being oh, yeah. forced to fend for yourself. One person looks out for you. The whole idea of what you're saying was she was like thrilled about like at least someone cares. And yes. now she's like, you know, it's one of those things that's just like, well, you know your father like yep. no that's you are brainwashed it's better than what she had right her life is better than it was before and that's all that matters and yeah. it's just and that's again and, if there had been like one person was like lady oh my god you need to get out <laughs> there's so crazy. many people living just like this like in their lives right now like yeah. maybe not as insanely like you know dramatically just utterly destroy destructive to somebody as this in every case but like there's so many people even today just living 
like through this year and they have some shitty job, you know, like they talk about all right. the time. These people that are like, hey, uh, tornado's coming, but you can't quit or we'll fire you like and you know, they don't move and yeah. they, they work. It's exact. I and mean, it's just like when you're able to lay it out like this, too, and like really look at it, it's the, the, the generational trauma. The term makes so much sense because you're just teaching people poor survival habits. Even the people who get out of that specific situation end up did. Uh, taking on poor survival habits so that they now have different kinds of terrible ways that they may treat their children. But it was better than their parents used to treat them. Yeah, it's just nuts. It yeah. leads right back to like the same line of thinking behind our show to not behind our show, but like conspiracy theories, things like Correct. that, like that. Because it gives you answers. Yeah, it gives you safety. Yeah, like it makes you, you feel like at least you, you can't know. understand why you, like everything is so fucked up and you'd like come up with some crazy theory instead of it just being like. People don't know how to do shit and they need to like be more honest with each other and reach out to each other more. Like it's, it's cults are the same exact yeah, thing too. It's crazy. It's uh, you know, the devil that you know is better than the devil that you don't. It's like That's exactly. the theme yep. of the, the podcast in a way. Mm -hmm. Yes, very much so. But going back to nanny, loose clothing would be way too dangerous in the mill and could get caught up in the machinery. And it's here now that she was wearing clothes that more fit her and she was able to be herself. Nanny truly began to flourish. For starters, Nanny was a good looking girl by all accounts, especially when it came to the small town of Blue Mountain standards. But more than that, it seemed that social life came extremely easily to Nanny. Don't Man, shake this your head. Sucks. No, this is you've just you're now you've just landed on another trope like my good dude. You were, you were like, by all accounts, she was a hottie. And, you know, she was doing, all to me that says is. She's had a terrible life, and for the first yep. time she gets attention, it's just dudes who want to bang her, which we're, we're is literally immediately on the path being like, their... men are evil. Oh, yeah. my God. Like, it's Listen, all, we're, we're, it we're is, going on Alex the path. Is right. we're this is, if I read this in a script, I'd be like, this sucks. This is, this is too, too much. This, we get. This is too yeah. much. <laughs> yeah, man. I, you are like, this is, you, you, you can see it coming from Unreal. a mile away, which, you know, we've done, you've, it means I've taught you something in this podcast. You know, I feel like you absorb some information. Every, you, like, <laughs> yeah, I feel like, what is this episode 2006? Like we've, yeah. we've literally done this so many times. It's like, well, there's another trope of like a person who's going to murder a bunch of people. It's crazy. Don't worry, just wait till we get to our next huge serial killer. Let It'd me, let me do the first episode improv and I bet, and then tell me how right I am. <laughs> <laughs> I think that'll be a really fun time to do. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. And moreover, uh, in Blue Mountain, um, but more than that, it seemed that social life had come really easily to Nanny, regardless of how tight a hold James may have had over her during childhood. Nanny very quickly had friends all over the mill. Every person she spoke to, she spoke to with a smile. Anytime anyone ever needed help, Nanny was the first to offer her assistance. This, in combination with her good looks, also meant that beyond friends, Nanny had all the boys looking her way, too. While she enjoyed spending her lunch and free time with the other girls around the mill, Nanny had other ideas. Those fantasies hadn't left her mind, and in fact, with the little freedom she now had, they only intensified. So to further her social circle, Nanny picked up smoking and would join the boys for smoke breaks as often as she could. Partly because she truly did enjoy the company and enjoyed smoking, but mostly because outside around the men, Nanny was queen and she held court. <laughs> <laughs> i can't i can't ha it's literally the like i'm different from other girls plus the like i only like guys because they get me tropes like i just can't handle it <laughs> Max, it's too much i didn't make this up man it's not coming out of my brain this is history oh heard this person how many husbands Yo, we'll talk See, about yeah, it. It's I, part yeah. of her story, yeah, man. It's yeah, part I of the story. A, I have an you idea where this is headed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's the question for you. This is the 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 ever the ever present question about a, uh, a woman that like this. Who do you think she kills first, a child or a husband? Whoa. <sighs> See, I think it's a trick question. And you're going to say a child. I but was going to guess. I was going to guess her uh, her we'll dad. See. But I guess yeah. Okay. Well, we'll find I'm hoping out. It's going to be your dad. You're on a you're on a very smart path with the dad thought, though, Alex. I really like it because obviously a it's a child trophy cliche. first. I don't. We'll see. We'll see what <sighs> happens. Feels like a trick question. I don't know. <laughs> okay. I was just throwing it out there. I wasn't trying to throw play mind games with you. I was just trying to see if we were on. You know, uh, I don't what, purport, your thoughts. I don't, I don't purport to be a expert of of uh, right. criminal mentality, but I hope it's the dad. <laughs> For yeah, fuck's right. sake. <laughs> 
The, regardless, she, like I said, when she would go smoking, Nanny would help hold court. The boys would vie for her attention and Nanny was happy to give it so long as she was the focus of their every effort. Moreover, now that Nanny was in town so often for work, she became the de facto errand runner for the farm. It wasn't long before Nanny became the pride of Blue Mountain. You'd be hard pressed to find a single person who would speak ill of the smiling, delightful, helpful little Nanny. Even so, it was still hard to shake the reputation that her family held when it came to romance. While most of the young boys were certainly interested in getting Nanny in bed, when it came to the idea of marriage, which Nanny made very clear was her end goal with all of the boys, the boys would begin to fall away slowly one by one. What? Who would have guessed? <laughs> right? Oh, what? Surprise. Literally all she's looking for is like a fucking person to be with. Someone to save her, her knight in shining armor that she read about in all those books because she knows her love is out there. Her true mance must be out there. I hate this. It was what? I hate yeah, this. You hate this? I thought you said Mathis for some reason. I was like, what? Her huh? true love, Mathis. Yep. No, that's God, it. no, thank you. No, I would rather not. It was well known in the town that she came from a poor household. It wouldn't have much to offer when it came to finances. See, back in these days, the women were still kind of expected to give a dowry of some sort or have or come along with some amount of property. But that was something that couldn't happen with Nanny. But that still didn't stop Nanny from looking for her fantasy made real. And with her mother, as in her example, she knew the life that she want, she did not want for herself and the life that she was desperate for as long it was the as it was the opposite of Louisa's. While most of the boys fell away. One hadn't seen much issue with Nanny and her lot in life, a boy by the name of Charlie Braggs, a 17-year-old, and in fact, he was the only of Nanny's potential suitors, the few that did try and date her, that had won over the hearts of both Nanny's mother and of James. James had never really approved of any Nanny's potential suitors for many reasons, including obviously the loss of Nanny, but all of the boys were boys. They went out every night, drank, enjoyed time with friends and dalliances with ladies. And Charlie did none of that. He was a homebody, not spending his money on himself, but of the upkeep of his own home and taking care of his sickly mother. This drew respect from James, oddly, and while Nanny, who didn't, and, and oddly, while Nanny, who did enjoy the company of Charlie and him being utterly smitten with her, she hadn't decided if she if he was worth marrying yet. But this didn't matter much because James and Louisa all but decided for her that she would marry Charlie. And in just four short months after they initially began dating, Nanny and Charlie were wed. <laughs> Boom. Man, <laughs> just like a recipe for disaster. We, yes, we thought it was going to be a happy marriage, sure of nothing but love and family, and they will die happily in the old age i promise i'm definitely angrier now than i was at the beginning of the episode <laughs> we'll see how much angry you get and while for nanny this not might have been exactly what she had fantasized about for so many years she couldn't help but admit that charlie fawned and loved her deeply and he was incredibly malleable he never put up much of a fight when they were dating and she seemed to have most of the control in the relationship while she wasn't too fond of the fact that he lived with his mother, that would at least change when they married and moved in together. And besides, she took note that he was taking care of a sickly woman and appreciated that about him. Nanny intended, to the best of her ability, to be the best housewife she could be, which meant leaving her job. She would keep their house perfectly clean, cook dinner for them nightly, and take care of wifely duties, which we, she was, at the start, very excited about. Sex was something she'd read about so often, though written about much more subtly in the is books. Is that what back you mean then. by wifely duties? That's yes, that's what that's what she meant because she this is her wifely duties comes from her diary that she would write in. So uh -huh. that's what she was referring to. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Are you a little bit more mad now. I'm not. I'm less mad. I mean, I'm mad. Let's just leave it at that. I'm mad. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. For her, sex at least was something she'd read so often about, but never something she'd done herself seeing what life it had led her mother, her mother into. And when the marriage and reception ended and the newlywed couple swept away to their new home, Nanny was brimming with excitement. Her new life had finally begun, and while it may not have been exactly what she was hoping for, it was miles and away better than the life she'd led up to this point. And when morning came and Nanny rolled out of bed to make her new husband some breakfast before work because he was going to work the day after the wedding, she walked into the kitchen 
and Nanny was met with her very first surprise. Thank you to Talkspace for sponsoring this episode. And meeting with your therapist to work on your mental health is just as helpful as hiring a personal trainer to work on your physical health, and the positive impact can be just as life-changing. Talkspace makes it possible to speak with a licensed therapist right from your phone, tablet, or computer. And unlike traditional therapy, you can message your therapist anytime via text, video, or voice. It's 100% secure and stigma-free, the way therapy should be. I've been in therapy now for years, and it has changed my life. I cannot imagine not going to therapy any longer because it's like having to go to the doctor just to get a checkup. Much like you would go to get your teeth checked, eyes checked, or body checked, your brain needs a checkup too. It's just as much an essential part of you. At Talkspace, your privacy and security are their number one priority. The app puts you in a private room with just you and your therapist where you can send messages 24-7 and get replies throughout the day. No need to wait for weekly appointments. Talkspace's encryption and added security features keep your conversation fully protected. Whether you struggle with anxiety, depression, self-doubt, or anything else, Talkspace gives you access to the help you need to move forward. Join Talkspace today and start moving forward with a single message. Just visit Talkspace.com and get $100 off your first month when you use promo code CHILL at sign up. That's $100 off at Talkspace.com, promo code CHILL. There sat Charlie's mother, already wide awake, looking with a dirty glance over at Nanny. When Nanny came into the kitchen, his mother said to her, Charlie will be needing his breakfast before work. Best I go wake him while you see to it, before getting up and waking Charlie. Nanny was in absolute shock. She hadn't known his mother would be here or if she'd been here overnight. And when Charlie came into the kitchen to get some breakfast before heading to work, he greeted his mother first, Nanny second. And Nanny was finally, before he walked out the door, able to get a little alone time with him and asked when his mother would be going home. His response was, she is home silly. She lives here with us. <laughs> blomp, blomp, blomp. <laughs> Never mind. I get, I get why Never she mind. killed everyone. I get why she killed everyone. <laughs> Never mind. You can, it's Never much make, clearer. It's, yeah, no, like uh, everything that happened to her before, I'm not even including that in my diagnosis. Just this one moment, would have. I would have been like, Everyone must die. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so this is your villain origin point. Yeah, 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 this is yeah, yeah, it, yeah. right? When you turn. Walk in the kitchen night after your wedding and mom, this is, you know, just, <laughs> oh, hey, I was waiting for y'all. I'd be like, honey, um, who is this? Why are they here? Oh, you know, my mother's going to live with us forever. I'd be like, remember, she's sickly. <laughs> uh, cool. So wait, so you're telling me that of, out of all the, all the options of people to kill, you gave us baby or husband first and not dad or uh, mother-in-law. That's correct. Cause I was giving, uh, yeah, yes, that is correct. Oh, uh, the mother-in-law is, seems like the obvious, like if she's gone, then I'm fine. Seems like the obvious first choice. I'm going to throw this even more uh, kind of a curveball. Nanny finds herself in a bizarre little finger situation. And you'll understand that at the end of what? the episode. <laughs> I know. I know. Damn, I know. What, what season? What season? <laughs> <laughs> what a season! What season? season what one. season of Littlefinger are we talking oh, oh, about? Oh, like early, early seasons. Yeah, where he's like, not like uh, crappy seasons where he finds himself constantly in like good positions due to like his own his own doing. You'll find out. Okay. What I mean. Remember right. when he was it like an interesting sense. character? Yeah, when he was an that yeah, when he was, yeah, exactly yeah. when he was an interesting All character. Right. I don't. We don't need to talk about Game of Thrones. I, I get enough. I get <laughs> enough different. hate mail about my preferences already. <laughs> you're not getting hate. If anything, you get people who are like he's right. You know, Alex is correct. <laughs> yeah. 100%. That's not been my experience so far. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Unsurprisingly, Nanny did not take well to this information initially, but she decided that she would try to power through. Apparently, she was sickly, so she understood to agree that she needed to be taken care of, and it wouldn't be forever, right? If she was of ill health, it would be only be a matter of time before she passed away. Unfortunately, though, for dear old Nanny, there were more surprises in store. As the days and weeks wore on, it became increasingly apparent that his mother was far from sickly. When Charlie was home and in the room, the mother was nothing but nice, courteous, and cordial to Nanny. But once he was gone, she was judgmental, cruel, cold, and distant, critiquing everything Nanny did when it came to house cleaning and caretaking, looking over her shoulder at every turn, double checking her work. And when Nanny did uh, and when Nanny did want to go out with Charlie for some time for themselves, then and only then did his mother's sicknesses seem to reemerge. 
The days turned to weeks, weeks into months, and months into years, and Charlie's sickly mother continued her daily berating of Nanny while Charlie worked in the thread mill. While she still had most of her old her hold over Charlie, what his mother said was law, and quickly Nanny realized she had simply gone from one authoritarian to another of a slightly meeker flavor, and she was desperate for escape once again. Initially, it was simply diving back into the romance stories that had held her attention when she was younger, and she once again consumed them voraciously, digging ever deeper into her fantasies, the love life she dreamed of having that she told herself she deserved. But Mother Braggs didn't only critique Nanny's work, she inspected every corner of the house and she would always inevitably find Nanny's dirty magazines, if you even want to call them that. And without skipping a beat, she would throw them in the garbage without even confronting her about it. No matter where Nanny hid them, Mother Braggs always ended up discovering them. So Nanny would eventually turn to the bottle and drown her sorrows in alcohol instead. And as the years waned God on, it damn. seemed, I know, I'm sorry to just keep going. What was that? I just said, God damn, is all I said. I know, it yeah. sucks. Yeah. And it's just, it's again, another stereotypical, okay, booze, alcohol, you know, that's another kind of thing that people fall into. And as the years waned on, it seemed that the spark and hope that Nanny had found in her marriage to Charlie Bags was fading. In her efforts to keep Charlie heavily under her sway, Nanny said she would provide sex to Charlie every single time he asked without question or, or any resistance. And by the, But by the third year, their carnal interest in one another had almost entirely faded. Nanny had begun to hate the man she married, seeing him as a weaselly, pathetic, and spineless rat. A, sa a sad runt she was forced into marrying by her parents. But still, she wouldn't give up the dream, and when the power sex held over Charlie stopped, she bore him children to lock him down forever. God four damn. Four daughters. Four daughters in all. But the children did not fix much, only giving Nanny an excuse not to sleep in the marital bed any longer, instead sleeping in the children's room in case they ever needed her. And Mother Bragg's incessant nagging never ceased, even with children. And Nanny's fantasy life grew further and further away. On the rare times that Nanny could get a babysitter, she would head straight to the gin mills of Aniston, getting drunk and sleeping with as many different men that made her feel beautiful and that sparked that distant hope that there was something more the out there. Gin mills? Yeah, the gin mills of Aniston. God, it sounds like a Star Wars. Yeah, yeah. What rumors may have swirled about Nanny would quickly overla be overlapped by the rumors of Charlie and his nightly excursions with alcohol and women of the thread mill where he still worked. And Nanny was well aware of each and every one of them because she was friends with everyone in town. And of her children, Nanny loved one more than the rest, her firstborn Melvina. In Melvina, Nanny saw the woman that she could have been, Melvina would be the one to live the life of romance and happiness that Nanny had. She would ensure that no matter the cost. And when Melvina was the only child, Nanny seemed to flourish for a little while, loving motherhood and enjoying the time she would have with her daughter. It seemed to fix everything for a bit. But her life had gone completely off track, just like her mother's. But Melvina would be different. And while Nanny spent a majority of her life and time home tending to one of her four infants and the mother-in-law, Charlie, and, and as well as her mother-in-law, Charlie's infidelities kept growing. He was disappearing now, sometimes up to two to three days at a time, all while becoming more and more the talk of the town. Poor Nanny to have such a useless and faithless husband. That, but Nanny smiled and played like the perfect housewife outwardly. All while inside, she had continued to build up her rage at what her life had become. As the days wore on, she pondered her life when she was a mother of a single child. Back then, even with the awful mother-in-law, she was a happier woman. She could focus on lovely Melvina and making her life perfect while still tending to her wifely duties and having time to herself to read her novels and enjoy her time. But with four children, there was no free time. There was no time for her. In her mind, not only was she unable to have a life with time of her own, but the other three children were taking precious time and energy she could be pouring into Melvina instead. To Nanny, it was a simple, it was a matter of simple practicality. After a long weekend on one of his benders, Charlie came home to his house or came back to his home surrounded by townsfolk. As he pushed through, he saw people were dressed in black and crying. 
Immediately, he thought of his mother, that something had happened. But as he went into the home, he only saw her, his mother, and Nanny alive and well, and he asked where the girls were. At the time, Whoa the youngest... No way! What? At the time, the youngest, Florine, was still breastfeeding and hadn't actually had any breakfast other than... Couldn't actually eat any solid breakfast that morning because oh. she was an infant. And Melvina ate only toast. But the middle two ate a full breakfast and went outside laughing and giggling to play that morning. And by night, through stomach pains, loss of energy, and vomiting, they both passed away. A doctor was called immediately to pronounce them dead she of acute... poisoned your fucking kids? Yeah. And the doctor, when he showed up, pronounced them dead of acute food poisoning. My. If... Per- if- he said if perhaps it had been caught earlier, they could have induced vomiting to save them, but there was no indication that something was wrong until it was too late. Even Mother Braggs was by Nanny's side consoling her. And unbeknownst to anyone else in that room, Nanny had concocted the perfect storm. By poisoning her two children, she alleviated herself from a large amount of the motherhood that she hated. Moreover, they died while Charlie was out and gallivanting for days, with the entire town aware of the unfortunate passing of the daughters before the, even the father did. This immediately cast aspersions on Charlie, and when he would go to his mother for comfort, he found that she too now sided with Nanny. For only a mother could possibly understand the love between she and her child had for each other, and he wasn't even here to take care of them when they needed him the most. He was an embarrassment. Nanny found herself the very center of everyone's love, attention, and consolation. Her grief and loss were profound, and and Nanny was good at playing the part. And whether purposefully done or the ramifications accidental, she was in the perfect position for everyone around her to love and care for her. And after a hurried funeral and a quick burial, that night when she placed a plate of food in front of Charlie with a sad smile, he looked up and says he saw something. Not grief or true sadness, nor guilt for leaving his wife for for so long. Instead, when he met Nanny's gaze, he said he saw past it all, a void, emptiness. And Charlie, for the first time, was scared for his life. And he was scared of his wife as well. After all had gone to bed, Charlie got up late at night, packed his bags, and went to the children's room and took Melvina, leaving behind Florine as she was nestled in Nanny's sleeping arms. And he ran, ran for their lives. He was convinced Nanny had killed the two children and the entire town was on her side. So he did the only thing he knew to do and ran. And when Nanny woke to find her favorite daughter gone along with her rat of a husband, the town doubled down on their support of her, taking it as evidence that Charlie was a good for nothing deadbeat. But Nanny, while soaking up the attention, was far from happy. Her favorite daughter was taking from her, the girl who was supposed to live the life she was. But Nanny had also discovered something else a quick way to solve problems and inherit unconditional love and support. I was going to say, yeah, the result of her killing people was she got everything she was looking for, which only reinforces the fact that now she's like, Oh, I just kill more people and even better things like, Oh my God. It is so insane that this can like work enough for you to become a serial killer. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, it goes on. Wait, we haven't even cracked into <sighs> anything and that's what next episode boys is all about is this is where this one ends <laughs> next week we'll return and finish the story of giggling granny nanny Doss, and uh she has quite a life ahead of her and it's insane what ha- ends up happening and how long she gets away from it but uh this is only a taste of what she ends up doing it's nuts thank you guys so much for listening i'm sorry to like leave you in that mental state but um <laughs> yeah good good alex taking a nice sweet little dreams nap. everyone I've been like looking at Anniston, Alabama the entire time while we've been doing this, like checking out the town. Cause I'm like, it can't be that big. It can't like, you know, just as an example, when you said at the gin mills, yep. I was thinking to myself like, Oh, they're making gin and Anniston. No, you mean like cotton gin as in like the cotton gin mills, <laughs> that kind of stuff where I'm just like trying to piece things together about this person's life. And it's just, even now, yeah, Anniston, Alabama has a population as of 2019 of 21,000 people. What's crazy is that surrounding it, and you know, we're talking about 1920, surrounding yeah. it is all forest. Yep. And yeah, it's, you know, there's the national, that giant national trail. Like there's, it's very interesting to see, man, it's, what a, you're out in the middle of nowhere, kind of. I mean, Birmingham's, 
in the area, but it's nowhere nearby. They aren't. They didn't have giant highway systems. No, so, transportation back then took forever. Still, yeah. So this is what a what a. I just. It's a lot. It's a lot. I know. I know. But it this is. isn't. But the thing is, like, this isn't one of those stories that. This is one of those, and she was caught kind of things. Rather than yeah. all the times that you know in the back country of such and such a place, there was like, and then I killed them all. Oh my god! Literally, like when you when we're at the end of next episode, like the way she moves and the way she does things is is so premeditated. She's just thinking so far ahead. Well, because like it gives her it's her drug. Yeah, hundred percent. Like mm-hmm. a seri- any serial killer, like the killings give them that rush, that desire fills that void for some of them. It's nuts, but. We'll talk about that next week. Thank you all so much for listening. Oh We're off God. to go do a. I'm always on the, I'm always on the well, side it. of the murderer for the first half. And then for the second half, I'm <laughs> yeah. like mad at them again. Well, she killed two innocent children. So not, at that point, I you feel, should turn. I feel bad. Yeah, I just it's it's a it's a horrible situation in every way. A hundred percent. So uh, by the end of next episode, if you still feel a little sympathy for Nanny, I think all that will evaporate over her the course of her life and her actions moving forward. We got to go do a mini soda on Patreon. Thank you guys so much for listening. We love you. And we'll see you next time. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Anyway, me and my wife were sitting outside indulging on our porch one night, enjoying ourselves. I needed to go to the bathroom, so I stepped back inside. And after a few moments, I hear my wife go, holy shit, get out here. So I quickly dash back outside. And she's looking up at the sky in awe. I look up too, and there's a perfect line of dozen lights traveling across the sky.